I suppose you might say that all serial killers in some capacity are disturbed. The mere thought of vividly imagining the murder of someone else is worrying, to say the least. But to actually carry out a full-blown killing of another human is something else altogether. There's a variety of psychological theories out there that can quite convincingly explain how someone is drawn to commit repeated murder. But in the case of Richard Chase, the vampire of Sacramento, I'm not sure if there's a psychological way to explain how vile and sick his murders actually were. Before we begin, I think it's important to note that while I won't be using any graphic images in this video, the subject of what we're about to discuss might not be for the faint of heart. Therefore, consider this a disclaimer as we dive into the world of the vampire of Sacramento. Like with most serial killers, we can see how their reality is shaped by simply looking at their childhood. Chase was abused quite severely by his parents, notably by his father, who would beat him. His parents were known to be quite authoritarian when raising him, perhaps even controlling. Chase would exhibit his destructive side quite early, for it's been noted he was prone to arson and even killing small animals, perhaps a prelude to his shocking murders later on. He was also a known alcoholic in his teenage years and a chronic drug abuser. It's clear to see that Chase developed hypochondria as he matured, constantly believing that there was something wrong with him. Some of these examples include believing that his heart would occasionally stop beating and that someone had stolen his pulmonary artery he would go to such extremes as holding oranges on his head, for he believed that vitamin C would be absorbed by his brain. Chase also believed that his cranial bones had become separated and were moving around. So he shaved his head so that he could keep an eye on it, as well as to prove to others that his skull was in fact moving. He would move out of his abusive home on the account that he believed his mother was trying to poison him and rented an apartment with a few of his friends but his roommates were soon to complain that he was always drunk or high on LSD. The drugs would change his behavior significantly, sometimes even leading him to walk around the apartment nude. His roommates soon got sick of his antics and asked him to move out, but Chase refused. Therefore, his roommates moved out instead, which makes me wonder how terrible it must have been to have actually lived with this guy. It was once he had the apartment all to himself did the weird stuff really start to happen. He began to capture various animals, sometimes disemboweling them, and other times consuming them raw. In some cases, he would mix the animal organs with Coca-Cola and blend them into a sickly concoction. Chase actually believed that by consuming animal organs, he was preventing his heart from shrinking. On one occasion, Chase injected himself with rabbit's blood in his veins and was rushed to hospital after feeling ill. After hearing what had happened to him, the hospital staff ushered him into a psychiatric ward in 1976, a move which he was adamant against. The staff here would actually nickname him Dracula because of his fixation with blood. Whilst at the ward, he broke the necks of two birds which he had caught through the window and then ripped off their heads and sucked out their blood. He was also caught extracting the blood from therapy dogs using syringes that he had stolen from the wards. As if it needed saying, Chase was quickly diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and underwent a dozen treatments involving a ton of psychoactive drugs. Somehow, Chase must have shown signs of behaving like a normal human being because he was no longer deemed a danger to society. In late 1976, he was released into his mother's custody the drugs he was prescribed were clearly working. I find it hard to believe that a man of his condition was cunning enough to fake wellness in order to return to society, nor do I think it likely that the medical ward in which he was staying would have cleared a man who had feasted on animal guts unless they were sure the drugs had some positive effect over him. Therefore, I think it's safe to say that his psychoactive drugs actually served him well in regulating his unsightly behavior and allowing him to reintegrate into the world as a more balanced man. But then, his mother began weaning him off his medication. Why? Well, your guess is as good as mine. It seemed like his mother didn't believe the drugs were necessary for his rehabilitation, and so prevented him from taking them. Even as Chase tore apart a cat with his own bare hands in their front yard, 
she did not facilitate his medication, nor even report this incident. It eerily echoes Chase's previous statement that his mother was trying to poison him, as it seems by stopping him from taking his prescribed medication, she literally was poisoning him, turning him back into an insane blood-sucking fiend. His mother even helped him get his own apartment, one he shared with roommates, but again, all of them moved out, leaving Chase alone again. By this point he was likely off his medication entirely, because a few months later, he was arrested in Nevada, near Pyramid Lake. Patrolling police had discovered his vehicle and inspected the inside only to find it covered in blood. When the police found him, they suspected he had killed someone because he was covered in blood himself. They even found a bucket of blood in the trunk of his car. However, the blood was determined to have been cow blood and no charges were filed against him. It still remains unknown just what exactly he was even doing here. If Chase wasn't entirely off his medication already by the cow blood incident, he most certainly was at the end of 1977, where he killed his first known victim in a drive-by shooting. The attack seemed to be unwarranted and completely random, because the victim, 51-year-old engineer Ambrose Griffin, had no connection to Chase at all. Just two weeks later, he attempted to enter the home of a woman, but because her doors were locked, he walked away. Chase would later explain to detectives that locked doors were a sign that he was not welcome, but unlocked doors were fair game and even an invitation for him to come inside. In one incident, he entered a couple's home who'd left their doors unlocked and proceeded to steal their belongings, but not before he urinated and defecated on their infant child's bedding. A month later, Chase would commit a sickening murder by breaking into the house of Teresa Wallin, a woman who was three months pregnant at the time. He then proceeded to have sex with her corpse, all the while stabbing her with a butcher's knife. He then removed her organs, cut off one of her nipples, and drank her blood. An account even has it that he used a yogurt container as a cup. As if that wasn't enough, he then collected dog feces from Wallin's backyard and stuffed it down her throat. That same month of January, Chase entered the home of Evelyn Mirov, a 38-year-old woman who was Chase's target. However, he encountered her friend, Danny Meredith, whom he shot with a .22 handgun. He then took Meredith's wallet and car keys before encountering Evelyn, whom he fatally shot. As if that wasn't bad enough, he then turned the gun on Evelyn's six-year-old son, Jason, and her two-year-old nephew, David, and shot them both. He then mutilated Evelyn's corpse sodomizing her and feeding on her as he did. It's noted that Chase would become startled by a visitor to the house who knocked on the door. So Chase fled Meredith's car and very strangely took the body of two-year-old David with him. The visitor alerted the police having seen Chase flee the premises. When the police arrived, they were able to discover that Chase had left perfect handprints and shoe imprints in Evelyn's blood. Chase was arrested shortly afterwards the body of two-year-old David was eventually found beheaded and tossed behind a church during Chase's getaway. When Chase was in custody, the police would search his apartment and found that the walls, floor, ceiling, refrigerator, and just about everything else, including Chase's eating and drinking utensils, were soaked and stained with blood. In 1979, Chase would stand trial for six counts of murder. His defense would try to plea insanity, where they would rely on Chase's mental illness and the idea that none of his crimes were planned in order to get him a life sentence as opposed to the death penalty. But on May 8th in 1979, the jury found Chase guilty of all accounts of murder and rejected the idea that Chase's mental health could save him from the death penalty. They believed that Chase knew right from wrong and therefore wasn't as insane as the defense were trying to portray him as. He was sentenced to die via gas chamber. Interestingly enough, when Chase was imprisoned and awaiting trial, his inmates became aware of his extremely violent nature. In fact, they feared him. According to prison officials, they would often try to talk Chase into committing suicide so that they didn't have to share the same building as him. But for those of you who are hoping Chase would suffer inside the gas chamber for his horrid crimes, you will likely be somewhat disappointed. 
On December 26, 1980, Chase seemed to have taken the advice of his inmates, for he committed suicide whilst on death row. He had overdosed on prescribed antidepressants that he had saved up over several weeks. Before his death, Chase had actually given a series of interviews with the police, where he spoke about being hunted by Nazis, the Italian Mafia, and even UFOs, and that he was killing in order to keep himself alive. He asked the police for a radar gun at one point, which is the same device that police use to track how fast a car is going. With the radar gun, he said he intended to apprehend the Nazi UFOs and bring them to the limelight so that they could stand trial for forcing him to commit the murders. When interviewed by FBI agent Robert Ressler, Chase was said to have been hoarding a large amount of macaroni and cheese in his pockets, which he had been storing as proof that the prison officials were working with the Nazis and were trying to poison him. Richard Chase stands out to me as a man who was clearly very sick, but what strikes me the most is his mother's passiveness, that she observed her own son's crazed behaviour and yet worked outside of his own interests by weeding him off his medication and chose to remain silent when witnessing his outbursts. But tell me what you thought about today's video and whether you believe Richard Chase was a product of his own environment or was he simply born this way? Perhaps you think it's a combination of genetic predisposition and the apparent physical abuse he had received at the hands of his father. Perhaps you can sympathise with Richard Chase in some regard, for he may have genuinely believed that he was being hunted by Nazi UFOs and that killing was the only way to be at peace. Do you think that Richard Chase could have been stopped had the hospital ward not dismissed him at all? Let me know in the comments below of your thoughts and don't forget to like the video and hit the subscribe button. Until the next time guys.